Until now in this section, we have been talking about threads and Java futures. Much of what we talked about was about starting threads in one way or another. But finally, the initiating thread had to block to get the results. This works well in many applications where we do imperative style development. With Servlet 3.0 and 3.1, servlets do not mandate that the user request thread be alive when the final data is sent back to the user. Now this change basically opened the door for reactive style programming. And in the last lecture, we talked briefly about this. We also specifically mentioned that Java Futures is not designed to handle reactive style programming. With JDK 8, the Java engineers added the ability to handle reactive style programming in Java. The name given to it is Completable Future. If you're familiar with JavaScript, it's also called Promises. Java Completable Futures is equivalent to JavaScript Promises. Let me start this topic by showing you how the reactive pipeline will look like when using completable futures. This is just so you get a feel for how completable future looks. We will talk about the individual stages of the pipeline in the coming lectures. Now what you see on the screen is an example of reactive style programming to run two tasks in parallel. Combine the results of these two tasks and then apply some function on the combined result. And then finally, handle the final combined result. Each activity that happens is also called the completion stage. In short, it's called a stage. Let's analyze this a bit. At the top, you see task one and task two as two lambda functions. They represent the task to be executed in parallel. One will run for three seconds and the other will run for five seconds. Then we use a completable future static method called supply async to start task one asynchronously. This method will return immediately after initiating the task one in a separate thread. A second task, task two, is also initiated when supply async method is called for it. So at this point, two tasks have been initiated asynchronously. Once the two tasks are completed successfully, the lambda function specified in the then combine method is called to handle the results, result one and result two. The return data from the lambda function is then fed as input to the next stage, that is the then apply stage, which simply adds the text handle apply to the end of the string. Then finally, the then accept consumer is called to handle the final result. The final string that is printed is shown at the bottom. So basically in this example, each stage adds something to the string. But we also notice that the output of the previous stage is the input to the next stage. Now this piece of code is also a little bit deceptive. The code simply specifies the stages of the pipeline, but does not trigger all the stages. This is important. For each stage, it specifies the code to be executed in the form of a supplier or a function or a by function or a consumer. And when I say the stage is triggered, I mean the code associated with the stage is run. Think about this entire pipeline as a specification for orchestrating the results coming from the asynchronous tasks, task one and task two. The pipeline itself is broken up into different stages where the data is transformed or combined or finally accepted. Then combine, then apply, then accept, then compose are all different ways to specify the stages for that pipeline. So when the control passes to the next statement, that is do something else, the only thing guaranteed is that the two tasks have been started executing in their own threads, as well as the fact that a pipeline has been created or specified. That's it. There is no guarantee that the pipeline has fully been executed. In fact, 
the chances are very, very less that the pipeline has been fully executed. It's simply a specification. The thread which created the pipeline can be released back to the thread pool or terminated, doesn't matter. In short, the thread does not have to block on anything for the final result of the pipeline to be relevant. So in our example, after five seconds, when both task one and task two are completed, the then combined stage of the pipeline is triggered. When the then combined stage completes, the then apply stage will be triggered and so on till the whole pipeline finishes execution. The final result that comes out of the pipeline can be passed to the user or printed out. You can see the final result at the bottom of the slide. If you call the join method on the pipeline, then it will wait for the pipeline to complete. In a more typical case, it's usually a part of the app server, say Spring Boot controller. Then the completable future can be returned to the app server for it to get the final result and send back to the user. Now let's take a look at how the completable future class looks. Note that I have listed down some of the most important methods of the class and not all of them. Completable future, as you see, it implements the future interface as well as another interface called the completion stage. So a completable future is also a future, and so you can use the get method to block as well. This, of course, is not encouraged. Much of the pipelining ability of the completable future comes from implementation of methods from the completion stage interface. Run async, supply async, then accept, then apply. All comes from the completion stage interface. So you can see on the screen methods for starting asynchronous tasks, methods for creating the stages of the pipeline, methods for handling multiple completable futures, methods for forcing the completion of the future, and finally methods for waiting on pipeline completion. We will go through these methods in the future lectures. However, in the next lecture, Let's take a deeper look at how to create a reactive pipeline using completable future.